welcome to the Asian American Forward podcast. I'm really excited because this week we have a guest. Um, and of course, I am joined by my regular co-host, Don Sun. Hi, Don. Hey, Katie. Hi, audience. And hi, my friend, Elisa. Welcome to our podcast. Yeah, today we are welcoming Eliza Orleans, who is running for DA in Manhattan, um, and we're really excited to interview her. We spend a lot of time on this show talking about New York City politics um, and generally looking ahead to um, how life will be in New York after the pandemic, so I'm really excited to get your perspective, Eliza. Well, I'm so happy to be here with both of you. Thanks for having me, and uh, yeah, looking forward to our conversation. I have to ask, I, because I've neglected to do this before we started recording, but Don, how do you know Eliza? <laughs> uh, you know, it's the, I'm working for Andrew since his uh, presidential election. Now it's, I'm working with uh, uh, Andrew for his uh, marital campaign in New York City. So it's the, 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 the number one thing is that I'm just looking for who we can align in Asian community. And uh, Eliza, the name is a pop-up. And also, it's that I know it's a, she can speak uh, Mandarin. That's a surprise me. So it's the uh, we do have a very very brief conversation over the Zoom, and uh, uh, I feel at least from my heart I can feel very close to her. So and also impress her the the uh, the job as the public defender to help poor people help the, uh, the community. That's why it's, the, it's very important that during the pandemic period and also during the New York election, both the, all the Asian candidates, I want to uh, help them, but not for their whether they can win the election or not, but just to mobilize the entire Asian community, get a sense of a community involvement. I think it's the, uh, Elisa is a kind of a, model for me and also I kind of a connection because I do study law and I know it's a, it's a lawyer so it's the that's approach so we can have a little bit of legal analysis especially from the district attorney's uh, perspective how regular Asian community can understand how this country run from a DA's office. That's where educational for our audience. That's the purpose I bring her here. And uh, I'm so happy to see your face here. Thank you. Eliza, I wanna get some background on you um, really quickly. So I'm, I'm curious about what got you into law in the first place, you're a public defender now. And then uh, like, why is the next step running for DA? So yes, thanks again for having me here. I'm so happy to be here with both of you and to introduce myself to your audience. I'm Eliza Orleans. And as has been said, I've been a public defender my entire career here in Manhattan. And um, I do speak a little bit of Mandarin. Uh, um, because I did spend time living in Beijing when I was younger. My parents adopted my sister from Beijing um, and China has always been a big part of my life. And so, you know, I'm so grateful to have so much support within the Asian American community and, um, you know, to be having this conversation that's so important. Um, but, but I basically, I, the reason I went to law school was to become a public defender. It was all I wanted to do with my life. It was the only job I applied for and I wanted to fight. Um, on behalf of people who otherwise couldn't afford to hire an attorney. And so for over a decade, I've represented, you know, over 3,000 people charged with crimes who couldn't afford to pay for a lawyer. And I've seen the way our criminal legal system is so unfair. It's unjust, it's cruel, it's inhumane, and it doesn't keep us safe. And so I realized that like watching the cycle just perpetuate and perpetuate, and meanwhile, give breaks to those who are wealthy, powerful, well-connected, and typically white, that we could do better. And we were falling behind cities like Philadelphia and Boston and San Francisco and Los Angeles. And so I decided to take this leap and run for district attorney. And it's been wild and it's really exciting. And it really feels like we are at such a pivotal moment in history where people are coming to a reckoning with the systemic racism that exists 
you know, not just within our criminal legal system, but across the board. And it's really enabled a public defender like me to run for office and run for DA and, and have the message be so incredibly resonant across the board. Good. Elisa, uh, since you just mentioned uh, uh, hate crime, especially it's uh, anti-Asian violence, uh, a couple of days ago on the New York street, there's uh, one guy called uh, Patrick. I forgot the last name, but uh, uh, he just uh, hit uh, one Asian lady, probably uh, around uh, 58 or 60 years old and they shove her on the ground and uh, her head hit the, the pole and have about uh, 10 stitches. And this guy ran away, but uh, thanks for the street camera and, uh, and the public, they send the information to the police department and this guy was caught. The, the situation is that uh, this guy was caught and sent to Queens the district attorney office. The district attorney is, uh, I think is a, uh, uh, Amanda Keats, she reviewed the case and immediately released this guy is out of without any charge. So these kind of things, the legal analysis behind it, uh, not many Asian community understand. So if there have a, some hate crime happened or violence happened on the street to the other ethnic group, the public uh, response or DA's office is maybe have a totally different uh, response. So from your perspective, how public or how Asian community should to put a pressure on the DA's office or what kind of a tactics they can express their concern and uh, educate the people and how DA office or at the district attorney, what's the, the logic and the thinking, uh, the line of a, uh, decision, how they make it. And that's the case. It's, I want to hear your opinion, especially as a candidate, if you want to drive Asian community support you. And I think it's a, they deserve to know a little bit your thought about this kind of case. Thank you. Well, so first of all, I have to say, I, I did see that video of um, Ms. Chung getting assaulted on the street in Queens, and it's absolutely horrifying. It's, it's awful to see. And, you know, we know that, that anti-Asian, you know, sentiment and hate crimes and violence towards uh, our Asian American community has, is at an all-time high. And it's so funny because, you know, as you know, my, my sister's Chinese, and so I worry about her, I worry about my nephew, um, and, and I see the way that when Donald Trump was calling it the Kung flu, the China virus, all of that, I was speaking out about it and people said, oh, you're being so sensitive. Why does it matter? Why does it matter? But now we are really seeing the effects of that and how this has really created this, this level of discrimination and hate and violence that is, is horrible and unacceptable, um, period. And I think, you know, I think there, this is something that's really reflected across the board that we've seen, you know, just the way in which our, our criminal legal system operates and, and these biases that exist within the system. And it extends to, you know, to, to so many different types of prosecutions. And we're seeing the fact that, you know, another case that, that happened here in Manhattan, um, you know, the case of Amy Cooper who was that white woman who called the police on the bird watcher, um, Christian Cooper in Central Park and basically said he was threatening her life. And in fact, you know, video showed he was not. And, you know, she was able to receive restorative justice sessions and then have her case dismissed. And, you know, when I spoke out about how that was so emblematic of the injustice that exists within our system, it wasn't that I don't think that she should get that benefit. It's just that other people, you know, and I represent thousands of people don't get that, you know, that, that this injustice just exists across the board. And I know I think about like, especially with regards to the, to the Asian American community, like that, you know, what during the, the financial crisis in 2008, the Manhattan District Attorney Cy Vance basically turned a blind eye toward so many powerful financial institutions. And only one criminal prosecution came out of the entire financial collapse. And that was this case that he vigorously prosecuted, which of course you know of, 
and attempted to humiliate this Chinese American family, the Sung family, the owners of Abacus Bank. And so it's just, you know, it just feels so like the system has just perpetuated and perpetuated. And this is, you know, this is why these local elections have such a huge impact, you know, why it matters so much that these leadership failures um, have such a huge impact on the communities in which we live. And, you know, it's why I'm running. It's, it's you know, I know why Andrew's running. It's why a lot of people are running because they want to to stand up and, and to, to fight against injustice everywhere. Yeah, I want to follow up on that because um, you have that cross-cultural experience having spent some time in Beijing as a child. Um, and our like primary goal with this podcast and kind of the goal of Don's career, if I can speak for him, um, is to like inspire more participation in politics by Asian Americans. So I'm curious from your perspective where you see like natural entry points for Asians and Asian Americans in U.S. politics or New York City politics in general? Um, that's such a good question and it's so important. You know, I mean, I, I like personally having grown up with a bilingual biracial family, like that's something that was has been really natural within my life. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think I, I remember when we were younger and my sister and I were in China and they asked my sister, are you Chinese? And she said, no, I'm Jewish, but my father's Chinese. <laughs> because she didn't, you know, because anyhow, my, my, my father's Chinese is far superior to mine. He's worked in China for, you know, longer than I've been alive. And, and so it's, it is true though. I think like we need to make sure that we are fostering those relationships, that we are making sure that, that there is outreach to all sorts of communities, that, that every campaign is intersectional and thinking about the needs of so many different communities across the board because if you think about fighting for justice for one community and another community like basically what we should be fighting is justice for everyone justice for all people uh you you bring me the the <clears throat> one American white lady. She has been spent all her career or life in China. And uh, later she got a Nobel Literature Prize, the Pearl Buck. So it's the, I just think it's the, when I look at you, I said, oh, this is the familiar. So, so anything is you can share is that your China experience, especially how you're dealing with the uh, um, the story about your sister. Anything you can share with us about the the, the family, especially Chinese sister, how you together? Yeah, um, you know, so growing up, it's so interesting because I think that right now we are in this kind of critical, pivotal moment in our nation's history where people are really coming to a reckoning with so much discrimination and racism and hate and injustice that exists across the board. Uh, and, and so I think that there are so many people who, especially people who are white, who maybe haven't really thought about these things throughout their life. But for me, I thought about it from a very young age, from the time I was even, you know, in elementary school, when I would go pick my sister up from her classroom and she was crying. And I would say, what, what's wrong? What happened? And she's like, oh, you know, the kids in my class were making fun of me, were being racist towards me, were calling me names, were pulling their eyes to the side, were doing things that, and so it was from such a young age that I recognized that, oh, wow, that doesn't happen to me because I'm white. And so I understood that privilege from like a very young age. And I think not all kids are so acutely aware of that because they don't have that you know, they don't have that experience of seeing the, the disparate treatment of someone else, especially someone in their own family. So, um, you know, I think it's, I, I learned very early on that I needed to speak up and speak out about discrimination. Um, and, and that's what I've always done. And, and I think it's, you know, it's incredibly important um, to, to do that. <laughs> Um, I want to turn the conversation a little bit um, just to talk about also um, kind of back to the current state of New York City and New York politics. Um, you said that this is kind of a pivotal moment in American history and politics. 
Um, and I totally agree. I, even like between the pandemic and all of the like civil rights protests over the summer, um, we can just see that there's like a lot of challenges coming down the pike for the next decade. Um, so I'm curious about given all of these challenges that New York City is gonna face coming out of the pandemic, what your priorities are if you were elected as DA? What do you see as like the top challenges? I mean, there are so many challenges that that we need to take on, but I do think that this this moment that we're living through, you know, we have this opportunity to move to the right side of history here, especially with regards to this DA election. You know, in the in the history of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, guess how many prosecutors they've had in the last century? What do you think? Do you know? Five hundred. Five hundred. No, in the last 100 years. Oh, oh, no sense. Katie, what do you think? I have no, wait, so how many prosecutors in the last- How many Manhattan DAs have they had in the last 100 years? Okay, I'm gonna say 35. No. Four. Oh, wow. Oh my God. They've had four, four Manhattan DAs in the last century and Every single one of them, like every single one that came before them, has been a white man. So no woman has ever held the position, um, you know, no, and certainly no public defender has ever held the position. And so, you know, I have spent my career going up against the Manhattan DA's office and seeing the way in which what these prosecutors do every day to the people like the people I represent is cruel and inhumane and it's wrong. And it's taken far too long for our country to acknowledge that. And, you know, all these career prosecutors who say they have the experience needed to take over this office, but I think it's quite the opposite and that people are finally waking up to what it means to have prosecutorial experience in the United States and to have played an active role in a system that is this unjust and cruel. What I sometimes say is why should we trust the arsonist to put out the fire. You know, I think it's public defenders who have the experience we need, who are really authentically committed to making these changes, but also have the institutional knowledge from having spent every day in court and representing people to actually bring about these changes that we so desperately need to see. And so, you know, I think that that's what gives us this real opportunity here. And I'm so excited uh, for what is really possible. And you know, for the, for the widespread support we've already gained. Uh, my question to you is uh, maybe a little bit, uh, uh, I don't know if the weather is proper or not, but at least uh, we can open the conversation. A lot of people say uh, New York, especially the Manhattan district office or it's a police system, it's a very corrupt and also it's a very bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. There's uh, anything is the from uh, your campaign or is from your story you see any particular uh, situation we really need uh, to turn it over to into the more transparent and how you can uh, rebuild the public trust to DA office. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the transparency and accountability um, are incredibly important. You know, we actually just put out a, a plan with regards to that because I think that that's one of the most critical things. And right now, there's just this kind of there's this this cone of silence. There's this opacity. They don't. They're not transparent at all. You have no idea what's happening behind closed doors. Who's getting charged? What charges are being brought? You know, the racial breakdown. That everything about about the way in which criminal cases are brought is just it is not at all transparent. So I think transparency is is absolutely critical in order to hold your district attorney accountable. But I think when you talk about corruption. You know, it, it's it's not necessarily corruption in like the classic sense of the way that you think about corruption, like pay to play, although there is certainly some of that with the failure to hold accountable, you know, the Trumps or Harvey Weinstein or Jeffrey Epstein and then, you know, the Manhattan DA taking massive campaign donations from their lawyers. 
But there's more to it than that. And it is kind of this, you mentioned policing. And I think that the fact that the NYPD have committed misconduct with stunning regularity, and I've seen it firsthand as a public defender. You know, I've seen the way in which they've not just committed physical violence in the streets, but made false arrests, um, you know, and, and perjured themselves in the courthouse. Walk in, you, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. And then lied under oath to a judge, to a jury, to a grand jury. And there is just no accountability, none no repercussions. And in fact, they get to continue to do their job, get paid, get paid overtime, you know, have the city pay out millions of dollars because of the assaults they perpetrate on New Yorkers. And, you know, the current Manhattan District Attorney's Office has really been complicit in this continuing misconduct. And so one of the things that I'm committed to doing is creating a police accountability unit and making sure that we hold the police accountable for misconduct. And I think that not only restores trust trust and integrity to the DA's office, but it also makes our community safer. The problem is for the DA office and the police department and for the layman, they understand these two government the departments are acting just like a partnership. So it's a, if you offend the police or if you do something harmful to the police department, your DA's office or oh, uh, your case is going to be very, very hard to process. So from your perspective in the future, if you want to put uh, more police uh, accountability or responsibility on that side, it's a whole challenge for DA office and for your deputy district attorney, because uh, I, I don't know how many deputy district attorney in your office are going to be, but it's going to create some internal conflict is it's how we solve it. Well, the police are already not being held accountable. You know, they're, they're uh, understandably, of course, you know, there should be some separation, which is why I'm saying I'm going to have this independent unit that is staffed by district attorneys, you know, in my office who have come from the public defender's office or other folks like me who've spent every day holding the police accountable. But I think, you know, it's, it, it's not that, there's something new, you know, the, the, the police are already not being held accountable. So I think this is something that is, is absolutely imperative to restore trust and integrity to the, the, to the community, to the district attorney's office between the two, because the police are perpetrating violence on our communities and having people locked up and, and they need to be held accountable if they are, if they're committing misconduct. Um, I'm really curious also about just looking back in your career as a public defender, if there is a moment that you're the most proud of, or that really kind of like is emblematic of your like desire to like keep working for justice in New York. Um, that's a great question. And I think that there are so many moments that I'm proud of that are just, um, you know, just even like little things that have happened where, you know, something I did actually made a difference in someone's life. Um, but there is a particular case that comes to mind because I represented a young woman who was 16 years old at the time. New York was one of the last states to continue prosecuting 15 and 16 year olds in adult criminal court. And she was charged with gun possession. You know, the cops pulled up as she was trying to shove a gun in the sleeve of her coat. And, you know, even though we begged for mercy and, and for an alternative to incarceration, the Manhattan DA's office wanted only to see this young woman in jail. So we started begging judges. And finally, a judge agreed to allow Jessica, my young client, to participate in, in an alternative to incarceration. And she attended this program, came back with her monthly updates, and her letters just said, oh, she's excelling. She's attending more hours than mandated. She's become a mentor to other kids. And she successfully completed the program. She came in with her certificate of completion. And the judge called us up to the bench and said, you know, I see hundreds of cases a week and I don't remember all of them, but this one really stuck with me. And Jessica, I'm so proud of you. And Miss Orleans, thank you so much for, for your advocacy. And I was like, no judge, thank you. This is thanks to you. And it was a great moment. And then you know, Jessica and I like remained in touch on and off, but about two years later, I got a phone call saying, you know, we know you're super busy. It was from her girlfriend. And I said, no, what is it? What's going on? And she said, well, 
we have an extra ticket and Jessica's graduating from high school and it would mean so much if you could be there. And I was like, I wouldn't miss it for the world. I called the judges chambers. She ended up coming. The principal heard we were coming, asked us both to speak. I cried at that high school graduation as though my own child was graduating from high school. And Jessica's now employed, engaged, has a baby on the way. And, you know, that case really stuck with me because even something as serious as gun possession, even something where she was certainly guilty of the crime she was charged with, need not be addressed solely with a punitive prison sentence. You know, we don't have to throw people's lives away. We can actually set them down a better path and we can measure success by whether or not someone returns to the criminal legal system rather than by the number of convictions we get in the years of, of sentences we get. And so I think that case really represents that for me. Thank you. And uh, I think it's a, uh, would you just give uh, some, uh, just a general picture of what's your campaign status at this moment? And uh, in terms of the fundraising, voter outreach, and uh, what's the vital field compared with the other candidate? How your uniqueness compared with the others? And then the, I can learn something from your campaign. Yeah. Well, um, I am so proud to be running the only grassroots campaign for Manhattan District Attorney. Um, you know, as of the last filing, we'd raised over $600,000 from over 7,300 individual contributions. And that is something, you know, people are giving us $5, $10, $25, um, whatever they can afford. But, you know, there are other candidates because our race has such unbelievably high donation limits. Um, the, the individual donation limit is over $35,000 per person for the primary alone. So that is just, I mean, it's, it's an unbelievable amount of money. And so there are people who are taking millions and millions of dollars from, you know, Ted Cruz donors and Donald Trump donors. And, and these are people who are trying to buy this position um, so that they can continue throwing black and brown people in cages um, and I think that that's not what the people of Manhattan want. And I think that's demonstrated by the number of grassroots supporters we have, by the number of volunteers we have. You know, we're phone banking and text banking and friend banking and reaching out to voters. And I'm so excited that people are so ready for this transformative change that we so desperately need. And so as the only public defender in the race, I think people realize that, that I'm the person to really bring about this much needed change. Uh, I'm so glad we were able to swap campaign notes with you. I also want to ask one less kind of fun question along those lines, which is that you were a participant on two seasons of Survivor. Um, so I'm curious if any, if you like learned any skills from that experience or if there's anything about being on Survivor that you found really applicable to campaigning. Um. That that's funny. I mean, listen, I've spent far more of my time in the courtroom in front of judges, you know, fighting on behalf of, of New Yorkers than I ever did in front of cameras. But I do think that, you know, I've I've been in the public eye since I was 21 years old. You know, I was in college when I went on Survivor. And I think that it did give me this kind of platform from which to advocate for the things that I've always wanted to see. So I've always used that platform to speak up, um, to be an activist, to, to, to shout about the issues that really matter. And so I feel lucky to have had that experience because especially during pandemic life, when you need to reach people through all channels, through social media, through other things, you know, and, and engage people who are not maybe typical Democratic donors or typical voters or typical, um, you know, people who might have ever been on a phone bank before, but we're reaching so many people, uh, you know, and, and I, I, I'm grateful for having that platform to be able to reach folks. That's awesome. And finally, also I being will, used to taking hate on the internet. Used to taking hate on the internet. That's, you know, good practice probably in this day and age. I'm like, what death threats? I've been getting those since college. <laughs> A little dark humor, wow. I know, sorry. <laughs> Um, so I will also add one last thing, which is that when we aren't talking about politics on this show, we like to talk about books. So do you have a book that you would like to recommend to our audience? It you can be anything. So 
I have it right here, which is like, this is so funny because this is my friend Fred Joseph's book and it's called The Black Friend on Being a Better White Person. And I think it's mandatory reading, especially now, especially given everything. And it's truly fantastic and beautiful. And um, I love him and I love the book and I recommend it very highly. Oh, that's awesome. Well, we'll wrap it up there for this week. Um, Eliza, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Absolutely. So great to see you and always fun to chat with Don. <laughs> I donate a hundred bucks in your campaign and I encourage our audience to give you some money, five, 10, hundred, whatever they can. Just yes, please you. do. Please do. Go to ElizaOrleans.com and donate if you can. We, we rely on grassroots donations and thank you, thank you, thank you.